Do you know what movie that's from? Come on, that, that, that went Malachi, is that you? Yeah, what movie is that from? The Good, the Bad, and the Ugly, huh? Oh, hey, fellas, listen, I'm so grateful to be here with you this morning. I love that. I can hear that in my head. I'm going to be hearing it the whole time while I'm preaching this morning. Did you know that America's Wild West days really was only about a period of about 20 years? Did you know that? The Wild West was really only a period of about 20 years. It started at the tail end of the American Civil War. And, um, you know, lots of guys were revved up for riding and fighting and for adventure and seeing the country. Um, and, you know, the appeal was there for a lot of men, a lot of young men. But you know, the appeal was also there for a lot of lawless men. The appeal was overwhelming. There were bands of outlaws. I'm going to tell you something. During the American Civil War, there were bands of outlaws on both sides that did very little fighting, but they did lots of pillaging and thieving and killing in the name of war. So the American Civil War ends, and they're looking for something to do, and there's all that wide open territory out west. In the expansion west attracted men that were both good and men that were both bad. And near the turn of the 20th century, Hollywood started making films based on this time period. Anybody like watching a western? Uh, you know, okay, tell you, just tell me, what's your favorite western? Go. Tombstone, thank you. That is just like, un I'm your Huckleberry right there. Undoubtedly uh, the greatest modern, you know. Magnificent Seven, any fans of Magnificent Seven? Any True Grit fans? Yeah. Which one, John Wayne or uh, Jeff? Uh, I'll tell you what, they were both good. They were both good, huh? I got choked up when I was talking to a buddy of mine about that scene where she got bit by the snake and he rode that pony into the ground to get that girl help. It still makes me choke up. And I, the reason why, uh, when I went to Bible college years ago, I had to sell my riding horse to go. I grew up on a farm with a lot of horses, a lot of work horses. And um, anyhow, I'm going to get past this. I'm going to get back on topic. These movies glamorized the Old West period, right? Now, it started off a little rough. Some of them old westerns were pretty rough. And it's hard for us in 2023 to go back and watch those with all the, you know, the grainy stuff and the, you know, I always loved, did you ever notice like the nighttime scenes in a western? All they did was just put a filter on. They filmed it in broad daylight. I mean, the dude's shadow was plain as day, you know, but it was supposed to be nighttime. But movies got better as they... But they glamorized all of it. The murder, the theft, the battles, the death, the heroism of good men. Hollywood glamorized all of that. And as it progressed into the 60s and 70s, Italians started making... Any Italians in the house? I see, I'm not Italian, okay? So that's all right. You can be proud. Go ahead. That's fine. It's all good. Italians started making westerns. Anybody know what they were called? Spaghetti. Spaghetti westerns because they were made in Italy and Spain. They were shot in Italy. But along came this guy. Did you ever hear of Sergio Leone? Sergio Leone started making these incredibly different um, uh, takes on his, uh, on his westerns. And so he had this thing called the Dollar Trilogy. We already talked about the good, the bad, and the ugly, right? That was the third one. The first one, starring Clint Eastwood, was the movie A Fistful of Dollars. The second one was A Few Dollars More, and then we got to the good, the bad, and the ugly. And so Sergio Leone was very different because he would have these wide panoramic shots where he would shoot. And I believe there's some pictures that are going to be popping up as we go along the way. He would give these wide panoramic shots that were kind of different. No one ever filmed like this. He should, there's, there's this great one, this, this great wide, and, and it, it doesn't do it justice because it's kind of squashed down a little bit. And, but he would also do these crazy close-ups, okay? Anybody recognize Eli Wallach there? He was the ugly in The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly Tuco. And, um, and so he would do these shots where there was a lot of nonverbal stuff going on, the squinting of the eyes, right? And in The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly is, I believe, arguably, the greatest Mexican standoff in cinematic history. And these are just a couple of screenshots. It, well, you know what it is? It's the second greatest Mexican standoff in cinematic history because the greatest Mexican standoff in cinematic history is from what? Go ahead, send it. If you know, you know. <laughs> Fellas, you need to know about the good and the bad and the ugly. Especially as it applies to our sexuality as men. 
That's what I'm here to talk to you about this morning. I'm here to talk to you about legendary purity. Jamie asked me to do this. There's been a lot of sweat involved and prayer involved here because I'm, I, I, I don't take this subject lightly to stand before you with the word of God and talk about this. And I want to take a look this morning at a man who had legendary purity and his name was Joseph. I want to go to Genesis chapter 39 and I want to read verses 1 through 23 and my link is not working so I'm stepping back here and I'm grabbing my Bible. This is the kind of stuff that goes wrong whenever... Sorry, have patience with me. We're going to Genesis chapter 39. Anybody still have an analog Bible with them? If you do, great. Anybody got a digital Bible with them? If you do, great. I don't care how you carry the word of God. I don't care if you have it on papyrus. Get it and get it in you. Genesis chapter 39, starting with verse 1, reading through 23. When Joseph was taken to Egypt by the Ishmaelite traders, he was purchased by Potiphar, an Egyptian officer. Potiphar was captain of the guard for Pharaoh, the king of Egypt. The Lord was with Joseph, so he succeeded in everything he did as he served in the home of his Egyptian master. Potiphar noticed this and realized that the Lord was with Joseph, giving him success in everything he did. This pleased Potiphar, so he soon made Joseph his personal attendant. He put him in charge of his entire household and everything he owned. From the day Joseph was put in charge of his master's household and property, the Lord began to bless Potiphar's household for Joseph's sake. All his household affairs ran smoothly, and his crops and livestock flourished. So Potiphar gave Joseph complete administrative responsibility over everything he owned. With Joseph there, he didn't worry about a thing except what? What kind of food to eat. Oh, yeah. Joseph was a very handsome and well-built young man, and Potiphar's wife soon began to look at him lustfully. Come and sleep with me, she demanded. But Joseph refused. Look, he told her, my master trusts me with everything in his entire household. No one here has more authority than I do. He has held back nothing from me except you because you are his wife. How could I do such a thing, a wicked thing, excuse me? It would be a great sin against God. She kept putting pressure on Joseph day after day, but he refused to sleep with her and he kept out of her way as much as possible. Verse 11, one day, however, no one else was around. When he went in to do his work, she came and grabbed him by his cloak, demanding, come on, sleep with me. Joseph tore himself away, but he left his cloak in her hand as he ran from the house. When she saw that he was holding his cloak and he had fled, she called out to her servant. Soon all the men came running. Look, my husband has brought this Hebrew slave here to make fools of us. He came into my room to rape me, but I screamed. When he heard me scream, he ran outside and got away, but he left his cloak behind with me. She kept the cloak with her until her husband came home. Then she told him her story. That Hebrew slave you brought into our house tried to come in and fool around with me, she said. But when I screamed, he ran outside, leaving his cloak with me. Potiphar was furious when he heard his wife's story about how Joseph had treated her. So he took Joseph and threw him into the prison where the king's prisoners were held. And there he remained. But the Lord was with Joseph in the prison and showed him his faithful love. And the Lord made Joseph a favorite with the prison warden. Before long, the warden put Joseph in charge of all the other prisoners and over everything that happened there. The warden had no more worries because Joseph took care of everything. The Lord was with him, and he caused everything that he did to succeed. God has created you and me in such a way that our sexuality is intricately woven into who we are as men. Sex is not a bad thing. God created it. He made us as sexual beings for a reason. God has a design in mind for it. He created man first, Adam, in the garden, and he said it wasn't good for Adam to be alone, so God made a helper for him, Eve, a woman. How do I know that's God's design? The word of God says so. It leads to procreation. God designed sexuality to fit inside a marriage between a man and a woman. Everything that is not of God 
is a counterfeit. Enter the enemy of our souls. The bad? Well, the bad thing about sex is when it's misused outside of God's guidelines. The Bible has many examples of the enemy tempting humans to misuse what God created. There was the sodomy, the homosexuality, and the fornication in Sodom and Gomorrah. There was the drunken incest of Lot and his daughters. There was the rapine incest of Tamar by her brother Amnon, both children of David. Abraham and Sarah perverted God's plan by using Hagar as a surrogate for Abram's seed. It is a violation. Fornication is a violation of the seventh commandment. In the, New, in the New Testament, the Apostle Paul dealt with issues of fornication, incest, homosexuality, lust. There are people today whose desire is to twist what God's word says in an attempt to justify their own selfish behavior. There's no doubt that yielding to temptation is a lot easier than resisting it at first. At first, it would be a lot easier just to give in to the sexual temptation. But for those who do yield, the path of life is scattered, littered with trash of remorse and trash of shame. How many people's souls grow sick, not from longing to taste the forbidden fruit, but because they ate the forbidden fruit and it turned to rot inside their stomachs and inside their souls? If we want to avoid this sickness of the soul, men, we have to resist the temptation. Rather than enjoying the warm embrace of lust for a season, we have to choose to resist it in favor of righteousness. And Joseph remains a sterling example for you and I that teaches us how we can do this. What does Joseph resist? He's not in a public place, is he? He's in a private chamber. It's perfectly secluded. I don't know what to call her other than Mrs. Potiphar. Doesn't necessarily roll off the tongue, does it? He's perfect, but he can. Scripture says he did master his wife. He's done what he can. Scripture says he did what he can to avoid her. Smart man. How many times do we make an effort to avoid temptation? Too many of us fall, I fear, because we don't make any attempt to keep ourselves away from the temptation. He did what he could, but when he came up against it, Mrs. Potiphar has set him up perfectly for this moment of pleasure that she wants. He's single. The most natural fleshly response for Joseph, the temptation would have been what? Lay with her. Let me ask you a question. What do you think Joseph's response would have been if he'd been filling his mind with porn from his cell phone all day long? Come on, brothers. For hours a day, for weeks on end, for years. What do you think he would have done when he had already given into the temptation of everything in the whole entire world that can come to you through this portal? I mean, it was the perfect scenario for him to take sinful revenge against the man who had been keeping him as a slave against his will, wouldn't it? But Joseph's God is more important to him than anything else on earth. 
And that was the key to his victory. So he says to her, how could I do such a wicked thing? It would be a great sin against God. And that is how he resisted. And that's how you and I can resist a temptation also. Because when it hits you, and I don't care who you are in this room, every pastor, every teenager, every guy anywhere else in the middle of life, contractor, lawyer, That's how you'll resist a temptation. God has to be so real to us and much more important to us. So here's the ugly. Humanly speaking, everything demanded that Joseph give in to the temptation of betting this woman. It says in the Bible, the temptation came daily. This woman was persistent. She was after him. Could you imagine, and her, her, her hints were anything but subtle. Could you imagine how wearying that would be? You see, the enemy has a way of setting the perfect scene for temptation to run its course. The enemy has a way of setting the absolute perfect scenario and perfect moment to dangle bait in front of you and I. The deck was stacked against Joseph. Hey, guys. The devil will give you plenty of privacy. The devil will get you all the privacy you need to give in to temptation. In your bedroom, in a hotel room away from your wife. And I'm going to tell you something. One of the greatest carrots, I'm not tempted by a carrot, Talk to me about a rack of ribs and then you're dangling something in front of me I want. (laughs) Listen, I'm the kind of guy that drove to Middletown, Maryland from Bedford County, Pennsylvania. I drove an hour and a half to score a deal on a $40 used smoker that was only used 10 times because I like I like smoking meat. We have a you know, in our church, by the way, if there's if you ever hear a man at Connect Church say, Hey, what are you smoking this weekend? They're not talking about the devil's lettuce. They're talking about what kind of meat or ribs, all right? But this is what the devil will do. He will dangle something beautiful and enticing in front of you, and he'll try to convince you that you're misunderstood. And he'll lie to you. And he'll tell you your wife doesn't care about your needs. And if you bite the bait, he'll tell you your wife can't ever satisfy your needs. Single men, he will tell you you can't do this ever. There's no such thing. It's okay. Give in. He'll tell you that. He'll tell you you're tired. He'll tell you you're stressed out. You're too stressed. It doesn't matter. Men, sexual integrity matters. He'll tell you that nobody appreciates what you do. You're secure. No one's ever going to find out. Teenagers, don't ever be tempted to think that, you know, this will never happen. This will never come crashing home on me. I can keep this secret on my phone. I promise you, I've dealt with two situations in the past week where it has wrecked lives already at 13 and 15 years old. But you know what? It hasn't finished them because of the grace of God, these lives are being restored. But I want to tell you something. The devil will tell you everything is fine. You'd be a fool not to take advantage of this opportunity. After all, nobody will ever know. Meanwhile, it's all stored right up here in your head And there's a callus starting to form on our souls when we are feeding ourselves porn. Whether it's on this or the TV or the computer. So how are we going to win this fight? Hmm? 
It's all a part of the devil's approach, and you have to be ready for the lies. One of the greatest philosophical quotes I ever heard came from a guy that uh, I never would have uh, taken in as philosophical leanings or whatever, but this is the best thing I ever read in my life. Mike Tyson said, everybody has a plan until they get punched in the mouth. <laughs> Let me tell you something, that preaches in my church. That well went over well. Everybody's got a plan until they take a shot in the teeth. And if you've ever had it happen to you, you're absolutely right. You can have a battle plan all you want. You take a shot in the teeth and the absolute pain, it, it blinds you. And you don't know what you're doing. I was a little kid when Muhammad Ali was ending his career, all right? He was at the tail end of his career. But I do remember watching TV because my dad liked to watch boxing, and I liked to watch boxing. And I, I haven't followed it in the past couple of years because, after all, I'm into motocross now. I've always loved dirt bikes, and so I love watching. Every Sunday afternoon, I'm either watching Supercross or motocross uh, with, with my boy, and so I, uh, I enjoy that. Muhammad Ali had a left jab that was so fast and could sting and screw up people's vision that they couldn't work past the next thing. I remember reading how in training, Muhammad Ali loved taking big punches when he would train. Angelo Dundee, his trainer, said that, he said, Ali never won a round during sparring because Ali wanted to know what it was like to, to take punch and take a beating, and that's what he trained to do. And, and Dundee didn't agree with him on doing it, but, you know, uh, it was working. Muhammad Ali always did his road work. Did you know Muhammad Ali? He was a big man, all right? And running for big men is not easy. But Muhammad Ali ran six miles a day, six days a week, except for his last week before a fight when he was paring down. And he loved jumping rope. Also not easy for a big man. But you got to remember something. Back then, in the 60s and 70s, in the early 80s, heavyweights went 15 rounds. Yeah. And in the ring of sexual temptation, you are fighting for your life. And your opponent is determined to put you down. The enemy of our souls will stalk us relentlessly. He's a brilliant strategist, and he times his shots really well. He will get you when you're tired. He will get you right after you've had an argument with your wife. Young men, he will get you right after you've had an argument with your parents or something at school has stressed you out. And he knows just when to un unleash a barrage, a flurry of blows on us, and just like a real boxer, I'm going to tell you something that Muhammad Ali knew. Your real fight isn't in the ring. Your real battle is just like Muhammad Ali. It's fought out there in the pre-fight training. That's where you're going to win the battle in the ring. In the daily grind of life, if you will keep yourself conditioned spiritually, you'll be able to withstand the assault of temptation when you enter the ring. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13 says this. Apostle Paul said, The temptations in your life are no different from what others experience, and God is faithful. He'll not allow the temptation to be more than you can stand. Do you hear me? It will not be more than you can withstand. When you are tempted, he, God, will show you a way out so that you can endure. The Apostle Paul was definitely one of the greatest champions ever. He constantly beat the devil because Paul first conquered the daily temptation to please himself. He prayed, he fasted, he soaked himself in God's word. He gave his life away for the sake of others. He suffered deprivation. Can you tell by looking at me, I haven't suffered deprivation. I have not, I mistranslated, Pastor. I thought it was buffet the body, not buffet the body. But I'm learning every day. Paul suffered persecution. He was mocked and made fun of by his followers. He constantly battled the temptation to give in, to go with the flow, to live for himself. He told Timothy, 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 12, fight the good fight for the true faith. God loves a good fight. 
Hold tightly to the eternal life to which God has called you, which you have declared so well before many witnesses. You have a lot of fights before you. Every man in this room, every young man in this room, every man with gray hair, you are not done battling for the sake of your soul. Every one of us as pastors. The question isn't whether or not you'll get in the ring, but what's going to happen when you do. The best time to stop temptation is when it starts. Temptation is just temptation. Temptation is not sin, by the way. Being tempted is not a sin. Giving in is a sin. The first time to fight it is when it starts. Don't let your mind drift. And if you're sitting in this room, if you're watching this, if it has its hooks in you, percentages are some of you, are, your forehead might be breaking into a sweat because you know I'm talking to you. I want you to know God forgives. First John chapter 1, verse 9 says, But if we confess our sins to him, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all wickedness. Joseph's God was more important to him than anything else in this world. And here's the thing, guys. Many of us have come into this room. We already know that what we've been doing is a sin against God, against our bodies, against our wives, or against our future wives. Some of us sitting in this room, our consciences have been seared. What do you mean? I mean, our consciences have become calloused because what we have allowed to enter through the eye gate and into our souls. Some of you are scared because some of the stuff that, excuse me, I'm just going to speak frankly to men. Do you mind? Some of the stuff that got you off before isn't working now. And now you're getting deeper into twisted stuff. And you know it's not right. It wasn't right to begin with, and it's only getting worse. I'm speaking to you the grace and the mercy of Jesus Christ who wants to break your chains and set you free this morning. And it's not going to happen by accident. You got into the closet in sin but you're not going to get out of the trap of the sin on your own. We can raise hands and worship in church like there's absolutely nothing wrong in our lives. Meanwhile, we're doing stuff, looking at stuff. This ain't in my notes, but I'm going to say this. Some men are trying to get their wives into stuff or their girlfriends into stuff that is depraved. She is made in the image of God. I'm speaking to you in love, men. I'm not condemning you. I'm here to speak life to you because I want you to be set free. She is made in the image of God. Honor her in such a way. And don't tell yourself ever that porn is just an innocent game. Women are trapped, brutally beaten, treated horribly. It's not an innocent game. And I know I got real serious real quick, didn't I? We were joking about the good, the bad, and the ugly, and where do we get to? Because we need to talk about it. We need to have our hearts softened before the Lord so that he can speak to us so that we're willing to do something about the change that's necessary. I'm telling you, Jesus Christ died on the cross so that you could be free. Where's Terry at? Terry, if you wouldn't mind coming to the keys, brother. We 
we need to repent of our sin against God. And we need to ask for his helping forgiveness right now. And you know what's going to happen if you do? God's going to hear your prayer. God's going to hear every earnest prayer offered to him this morning. Jesus Christ is the way out of the prison that has you buried in secrecy. Viewing pornography is not innocent, brothers. It's not innocent. It seems like an innocent thing. That's how the devil dangles it in front of us. We need to repent of our sin against God this morning if we've indulged in these things. We need to ask for his helping forgiveness right now in this moment. And what I want to ask you simply is this, and I only want an honest response to this. If you are here as a man and God has already given you a battle over sexual temptation, whether it's been using porn or you've been forgiven of fornication, or you've been set free of something, if that's you, I'm gonna ask you to do me a favor. If God has already set you free in a battle, and I mean you are truly free, would you mind raising your hand? If God's done it, yeah, give God the glory. Now what I'm gonna ask you to do is this. I'm gonna ask you to stand. I'm gonna ask you to stand. Every guy that put your hand up right there in that moment, stand up. Come on, there was more of you. I'm not making any accusation against any man in this room. Please hear my heart's cry. I want you to be set free. And if you're here in this room and you're battling, if Mrs. Potiphar is coming after you every day through this, through your computer, through your TV. If you're engaged in sinful sexual activity with a live person and it's your desire to be set free this morning, is that you? In the count of three, I'm gonna ask you to jump to your feet and approach one of these men and ask them to pray with you Please let, de- let, down, let go of your pride. If you're fighting a battle, I, listen, I'm not going to stand here and think about you and think bad things about you if you jump up and you ask for prayer because you want to be set free. I'm going to think great things about you because it's somebody being honest about where they're at in life and they want to have a change in their life. And I'm telling you, if you want to change this, if you want to be set free of this, God will do it. So if that's you, I want you to jump to your feet and go to one of these men. And if you're standing on your feet, men, if you've been set free, I want you to lay hands on whoever approaches you and pray that they're delivered. Get their name. Call them out by name. Are you ready? One, two, three. Nobody, thank you. Thank you for the guts that it takes to stand up. Thank you. God will honor that. God will honor that. And you may be so absolutely stumped in this moment and you think, how could I stand? What would my people think of me? What would my pastor with me think of me? Let me tell you something. Your pastor will think the world of you. It's not too late for you. If you want prayer, get with one of these guys. Get with one of these men. Thank you for praying. Gentlemen, we are called by the word of God to be sexually pure. It says it in the word of God that fornication is sin. What's fornication? Sex outside of marriage. I thank God that he was able to preserve me. I thank God that he was able to preserve you. Thank God for what he's done in your life. There are people inside the church now 
There are denominations of churches now that want to pretend like the Word of God says that certain things are okay that aren't okay with God's Word. Homosexuality is a way that the devil confuses men because you've been mistreated or you've been frustrated or you've been confused or you've been scared or you haven't found acceptance in certain groups of men. So you felt like you were relegated to that certain thing. And there are people that say that homosexuality is perfectly fine. It is a sin against God. And there's an element in churches today, I'm gonna be honest with you, that act like homosexuality is wrong, but good old fashioned heterosexual fornication, they don't have a problem with that. It's just as sinful. Using pornography is just as sinful. You understand the word of God has a, has a line. The word of God speaks to us and it's all in here, what God wants for us. And you can be pure. You can walk in integrity and you're not gonna do it by yourself. You've gotta have somebody to talk to. You've gotta have somebody you can talk to to say, I messed up. I stumbled, I looked at something I shouldn't have done. I got into something I shouldn't have. Will you pray with me that God sets me free? Find a brother. You need a brother. I'm gonna ask, would you all stand with me this morning? It's not too late for God to work. It's not too late for God to bring about a change in your life. I want to pray for you this morning. Come on, let's let's explore the grace and the mercy of Jesus. Jesus, you have called us to sexual integrity. You have called us to purity in this life. And Jesus, I am so grateful that you forgive me when I approach Jesus grace not grace doesn't excuse Jesus but you pull us up higher and you draw us into relationship with you Lord I pray that we would be men with legendary purity just like Joseph that we would learn to avoid where temptation likes to hang out. And even when temptation comes, God, we would stand up and say, how could I do such a thing against this person? And how could I do such a wicked thing against God? God, may it be for each and every man and young man in this room that you would be more real and more important to us than any momentary pleasure. Help us to walk in integrity. This is our prayer this morning.